And on the line, um, we have um, Alex Bainbridge. Um, Alex is um, the convener of um, Socialist Alliance. Um, and so we're going to have him on the line to have a bit, I guess, of a political discussion about some of the political implications of um, COVID-19 and this sort of whole crisis in the context of what's happening, I guess, in Australian politics. Good morning, Alex. Uh, good morning, Jacob. Um, yeah, I guess the kind of first question, I guess, what, how can you, I guess, summarise, um, I guess, the political situation? I guess what has sort of COVID, maybe the first sort of question we should start with is, what has this sort of COVID-19 kind of crisis revealed, I guess, about the nature of um, the political system we live under, which is capitalism? Well, I think the first thing you have to say very clearly, the government has badly mishandled this issue, both in Australia and in several other countries, although it's been uneven around the world. But what you see is the government does not care about us, about ordinary people, the same as it was the case with the bushfires, the same as is the case in general with climate change. Uh, the government is very clearly, their number one concern is about looking after the profits of big corporations and the health care of the population is decidedly a secondary or tertiary issue for them. Mm. And I guess, what, what can you give some examples of how, you know, the government has kind of failed in terms of serving the interests of ordinary people? Well, look, you know, we've known about this um, issue uh, since the end of last year, and certainly since uh, January and even early February was, you know, the main, the main details have been sort of quite clear. But, you know, the government... You know, doesn't have a plan. Uh, they haven't been. Um, you know, there's not enough testing kits. Uh, at least that's the impression. There's not enough testing happening in Australia. I mean, compared to South South Korea, where they've been testing twenty thousand people per day, uh, and then and then following up individual cases to sort of to really make sure that uh, they one know know the spread of the disease, and two that uh, the people are getting adequate care. There's nothing remotely like that happening in Australia. No, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, Alex, uh, just you mentioned South Korea, which who, you know that that's a country that's been doing quite a good job of following up. Uh, tests are absolutely essential in the fighting off of a pandemic. We need to understand where the transmissions are coming from and how many people actually have the, um, uh, you know, the disease. But uh, here in Australia, I believe um, I'm, I unfortunately have a lot to do with Royal Melbourne Hospital at the moment, where they're doing a lot of testing. Uh, if you don't show uh, serious enough symptoms. Uh, they're not testing you. Uh, so you could be a carrier, you could actually have COVID-19, but they're not testing you. Um, you. Do you think that there is a political, um, you know, there's a political element to the, the lack of tests that we have? I mean, surely we would be able to get those tests if we mobilised. What's the, you know, what's the barrier there? And what, you know, what's, what's the justification for, uh, for the government to not roll out these tests in such an aggressive manner when we know that this actually helps with regards to stopping transmission? Look, I don't know the exact technicalities of how many tests we've got and how how quickly it is to to manufacture them or to or to get hold of them. But I think the answer to your question basically is that even though our health system in Australia is better than some other countries, it still has been impacted profoundly by neoliberalism, which you know really is the is the dominant policy position of capitalism around around the world, and uh, and that has basically meant that everything is about um, you know, looking after the checking the bottom line, the you know the cost cutting measures, the uh, uh, you know you know market mechanisms, to, even to some extent, uh, in the healthcare system as well. And I I think that I think that the government has not prepared even what could have been done between January and now. And I mean, I I assume that. I mean, I don't know what the situation was with uh, how quickly tests can be manufactured, but I do know that if South Korea can, uh, can organise 3,000 tests a day, it would have been possible for Australia to do a better job had they prepared properly since January. Mm. Mm. And what about um, just in regards to closure of schools and universities? Um, I, I have heard that Scott Morrison uh, personally called um, the uh, the coordinator of all the Catholic schools here in Australia, which is approximately 600 schools, and actually personally intervened to stop the closure of these schools. Um, can you give us some reasoning about Morrison's reticence to close schools and you know places like universities when we see from other uh, parts of the world that schools and universities have played a huge role in transmission of the viruses. Why is there such a reticence to close the schools and universities at this stage? 
Well, I think actually the first thing you should notice is that a lot of private schools have been closing or um, uh, or yes. at least you know, uh, projecting to do so early before Easter. And um, and that's that's already an indication about uh, one set of standards for for the people who can afford to send their kids to to private schools compared to the public school system. Look, I think there's I think there's several aspects about it. I mean, I, and again, it's hard to uh, speculate or put you know exact motives into the into the minds of the government. But I think that what is very clear is that yeah, if you close down schools and you close down other sectors of the economy. Uh, that is going to have a, that's going to have an economic impact, and you know certainly if schools are closed, that has an implication for uh, for parents to uh, be looking after their kids. It, it's going to have a broader economic impact, and you see from the stimulus package a week or so ago, the government's concern. You, you can see by the priorities of that stimulus package that the, con- the concerns of the government are about looking after big corporations, not looking after the healthcare of the population. So I basically don't trust Morrison when he says that uh, you know they're following the science and they're doing the best possible uh, things and that really there's you know sensible health reasons not to close schools. Um, and because you look at his overall package is about looking after you know, big corporations. So I mean I think I think that's basically what it is. And as soon as mm-hmm. they as soon as they do close down schools, that's going to uh, that raises broader questions about why isn't the government looking after workers that need um, stick leave? Why isn't the government uh, looking after practical things that people need, like, you know, we're going to make sure you're going to uh, not lose your home as a result of this crisis? Hmm. Um, going into that, um, one of the things about this crisis um, has been um, around the question around social distancing. Um, basically, experts are encouraging that basically everyone... Um, um, stays home if, if if possible and avoids any kind of gatherings, any sort of social activities, although, I mean, some social activities in small numbers, etc. I mean, they're not completely, you know, experts not necessarily saying to put your life on hold completely, but there is uh, a strong push, you know, that people, if they're in a position to, they should stay home and self-isolate themselves to society for the duration and for the purposes, I guess, of flattening the curve in a sense that one of the issues is that our healthcare system isn't well equipped um, to take these cases on. Um, So there has to be, you know, there has to be the more COVID-19 cases happen um, in our our overcrowded healthcare system, the more that, you know, someone might get refused treatment for another condition that might not necessarily be related to COVID-19. But I guess this whole question around self-isolation, what does that kind of reveal, I guess, about the class inequalities, I guess, in Australia and in the world, especially when you consider that the majority majority of working class people don't actually have the means to self-isolate themselves. Yeah, well, I think that you've exactly hit the nail on the head. And if, if, if what the experts are saying is correct, then we need to have, um, you know, physical distance and, and you know, and, and be isolated from, from social gatherings, um, then uh, what is needed is people need to have the capacity to be able to do that. What that means is sick leave. It means the guarantee that you're not going to be thrown out of your house because you can't pay a mortgage or you can't pay your rent. It means that uh, you know people need to either be able to go to the shops or else the government needs to set up some other service so that food can be delivered to people's houses. Uh, and it, it you know it means that people you know people need to have those sort of guaranteed you know I guess the 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 confidence and um, the expectation that that uh, when this is resolved they're going to have a job to return to. Now uh, all those things are. All those things go against the capitalist logic of individual firms uh, making their own individual decisions based on their own individual profitability. All those things to implement them properly and thoroughly and systematically require the government to step in to make an intervention into the market, and then especially if it means things like you know uh, rolling out you know, mass testing, roll, you know, looking at you know, requisitioning what is needed uh, to deal with the health aspects of. Of this crisis, mm. all those things have implications for the government to step in and uh, take control of, uh, you know, various aspects of the economy and put the profits of big corporations second. And you know, this is again, I've said this a few times, but it is a it is a practical question, and you sort of you can look at it in multiple different ways. In practice, what the government is doing is looking after big corporate profits instead of ordinary people. And I think, you know, I think, yeah, sure, okay, if social isolation is what is needed. 
the government needs to mandate that people have got access to sick leave, you know, income while they can't go out and earn an income, guaranteed job when they come back, and protections about their housing. Those things are... You, you, you can't you can't say on the one hand we we need socialisation on the social isolation on one hand and then not provide those things on the other. Yeah, it's actually a matter of survival for a lot of people and and a large number of people now because um, as I mentioned earlier in the show, uh, this these neoliberal policies that have been implemented for decades have whittled away at the sick leave and the entitlement and the workers' conditions. All of these things which would benefit you know uh, the community as a whole, which would mean that people would be able to uh, you know, self-isolate. Um, you know, th- this is a, a growing problem that we have. Uh, we we have the fact that. Um you know, this individualistic idea of neoliberal policy, I mean, you work hard and you make money and you're an individual, et cetera, um, versus the needs of the community. We've gotten to this point where our neoliberal individualism is now harming the community as a whole because we can't come together and we can't work uh, in this situation because literally for some people, going to work is a matter of survival. And all around the world, we're seeing these, um, uh, you know, quite... uh, um, authoritarian responses to people breaking uh, social isolation rules. Uh, we have, I think in Italy, they've now uh, charged 40,000 people for, for going out um, amidst a lockdown. Um, you know, we can't have these authoritarian punishments without supporting these individuals to actually make decisions that don't mean they starve and that don't mean they get kicked out, um, you know, of their homes. Um, you know, how, what sort of things can we as as a community, how can we pressure the government to implement these things that stop people from making survival choices and then getting fined for those survival choices because they're breaking the rules, so to speak? Mm. Well, I mean, firstly, on the sort of neoliberalism, I think the best examples that I know about that Come from Britain, where the, the public, the National Health Service is uh, is run uh, more as a public service than Australian Medicare system is. And Australian Medicare is still a fee for service uh, mm. system, except the government pays a portion of the fee. That so that's actually that's actually a less desirable setup than than an actual government provided health service. But but in Britain they have had a you know because of neoliberalism they've had big cutbacks on the capacity of the, of the NHS so that every year in winter they the NHS is overstretched there's no there's no excess capacity whatsoever in the system because they have cut back you know so much as a result of neoliberalism now what that means is there is zero excess capacity in the system for when a bigger you know pandemic like like COVID nineteen comes along and then you have the <laughs> The embarrassing situation of the government putting out by tweet, oh, uh, if any company can make ventilators, uh, please, we'd love to buy them. And you know, mm. like this is a sort of an absolutely ridiculous situation where, you know, the government should be able to, uh, you know, well, I mean, the government, I mean, uh, well, as I, as I said before, we've known since January and early February that this is a situation. Uh, the British uh, government has provided health service reports in the past about the uh, the lack of ventilators, and uh, you know this is a this is a a problem that was knowable, was foreseen, not only foreseeable, was foreseen, mm. and still they have not taken the the necessary steps to uh, to to deal with it, even though they've known about this disease for several months, and that is 100% a result of neoliberalism. Now, you also were asking about authoritarianism and like, you know, I mean, I'm speaking to you from Queensland. So in Queensland, we've got a situation Mm -hmm. where uh, the police are going to be checking uh, people to make sure they're sort of self-isolating and the penalty is going to be a $13,000 fine if uh, if they're not self-isolating. Now, I understand in WA, the situation is even worse, like $50,000. And I mean, it varies from state to state. But here, you've got this situation where Police are involved, and there are fines to individuals if you're if you're not self-isolating. But on the other hand, there is not the capacity to go and get a test from your doctor or some other health clinic mm, or yes. like in South Korea, literally drive-through testing. You can't actually test for yourself, um, and there's not the, the sick leave and the other protections I mentioned earlier uh, that are provided. So it's a it's a real um, it's it's a it's a it's a it's, it's, it's a way of managing the system, which is basically 
not about looking after people's needs, but you know, putting in these authoritarian punishments that are, you know, not good for actually solving the problem. All they're good yeah. is, all, all they're good for is managing managing an unfair system on behalf of uh, the big end of town that uh, that know that people will rebel and resist. Because I mean, this, I mean, I've, we're just at the beginning of this in Australia. Yes, and yeah. uh, and you can't imagine that without a serious change of government policy. There's not going to come a time when, on the one hand, when the disease gets worse and people need to take more more measures to, uh, you know, to stop some aspects of social and economic life. But there's not the not the not the infrastructure in place to make that possible. Um, mm. You know, it, it's not it's not a far-fetched scenario to think that people will uh, will want to and in fact will need to protest about it and and. I mean, obviously, from our point of view, we need to be thinking about various ways of, um, you know, of making protest possible. But uh, I, I personally, am one hundred percent against uh, outlawing protest in this situation. I think it's one thing to close down a big football match or a big concert or, or something like that. I mean, I think there's, you know, there are there are there are cases for some of those measures in, you know, in a medical emergency. Uh, but democratic rights, including, you know, including the 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 democratic right, you know, not to be fined just because uh, some government doesn't, you know, doesn't think you're, you're sort of self isolating enough. I mean, in actual fact, so, well, I mean, other countries' experience has shown that you don't need a police fine to get people to self isolate when there is adequate income support, adequate sick leave, adequate protection exactly. of your house yep. and, and, and livelihood. So those are the things that we need to worry about, not uh, not authoritarian measures to. Uh, that basically blame the individual, which again is that that gets back to that neo neoliberalism question. It's all about an individual's responsibility, not the social infrastructure and the social support that can make it possible. Yeah. Now, on the question around um, protest and how we can sort of build, I guess, a fight back, I think one of the more interesting things, I mean, especially as a Marxist and a, and a socialist, one of the, the, I think, amazing things, I guess, that this crisis um, reveals, because we've been sort of, um, the capitalist media has been trying to tell this kind of myth that, um, you know, capitalists and the wealth producers are essential to um, to the production and the runnings of society. But oh, I think yeah. I, I think COVID-19 actually demonstrates um, that it's actually workers um, that are essential to um, the production of society. Um, and the one and they're the um, and when you look at the fact it is actually healthcare workers, um, it is the um, Fast, well, not fast. Um, food workers um, yep. uh, and uh, education workers, workers, supermarkets. Stockists. They're the ones who are actually essential to keeping society running in this period. It's not actually, in fact, in some ways, the government is actually a hindrance to actually ordinary people. Um, and of course, it's actually ordinary people who are, you know, organising themselves to socially isolate at a much greater rate um, than what the government is acting. Mm. And yeah. And I'd like to hear sort of your comments on, you know, what this kind of reveals about the nature of, you know, the, um, class relations and, and how workers are essential to production. Well, I mean, I think, uh, well, I mean, I think, I think the thing about class relations, I mean, the thing I'd say, I guess, emphasize again is that, you know, I mean, we've, we've learned from Naomi Klein the whole idea about the shock doctrine. And when there is a crisis, uh, the capitalist elite, whether it's corporate or government, step in to try and basically manage the crisis in the, in, in their own interests. And even potentially to get policies implemented that are that are that benefit them and you know at the expense of ordinary people. Now that's what we're already seeing with this crisis, as with others. So I think that's actually that's in terms of the way you know the capitalist authorities respond uh, to you know protect profits and not people. Now, yeah, I mean you're right that I mean I mean I think yeah we in the socialist movement have known for a long time that it's that it's workers that run society, not bosses and. And I mean, you know, the number of workplaces you've been in, you sort of say to people, look, you know, if the boss didn't turn up tomorrow, what would change? Nothing. Things would just tick along as normal. If all of us didn't show up tomorrow, everything would stop. I mean, so we know that. And um, and yeah, look, I mean, all the things I'm talking about, even if we were to have, like, you know, if, if we need if we need isolation and we need a service to, you know, to distribute distribute food to people's home, we obviously need healthcare workers. We need uh, we do need we do need you know, a number of services to keep on operating. Um, and, yeah, we need workers to do that. But to make that possible in this kind of a crisis, what we need is you know, mass testing so that people know 
um, if they if they're sick or not, if they need to if they need to sort of um, uh, you know take measures to prevent transmission to other people. And then, as has happened in some other countries, where where cases are identified, even if it's, even when it's larger numbers than what we've seen in Australia. I mean, like as far as I can tell, there's there's not very much compared to other countries of uh, literally chasing down all of the individuals that an infected person has been um, in touch with to basically test them as well and then take whatever public health measures. I mean, that, that's the basics of public health. I mean, you know, that, and, you know, the public health experts know that. Uh, but, I mean, well, the starting point of it is, is the mass testing, which we haven't seen in Australia. It should be free, of course. Um, and, and, you know, everything else builds from that. And that is not the approach the government has taken today. Hmm. All right. Well, um, Alex, um, I guess we'll kind of wrap it up now. Um, do you have any kind of final comments you would like to make? Uh, look, just I would like to say that it is uh, important that we, uh, you know, we we do look after each other in this um, in this time. I mean, like there is going to be, uh, you know, a lot of things come under pressure, but uh, you know, human solidarity uh, is is. Is, is what can work both on the small scale in terms of looking after people in your own neighbourhood but also on the macro scale as well and we need to push for government policies that point in that direction we can expect that um, that we will come out of this I think you know I think what this crisis reveals and it's, it's a little bit like climate change on a smaller scale but um, the climate the, the, the crisis reveals that the government's not, not looking after our interests it does point to a whole lot of inadequacies in the way the current capitalist system is point up uh, is, is set up. It points us in the direction of organising society in a better way in general, both to deal with this immediate crisis, but if we take those pointers and, and look at them more generally, like how can we organise our healthcare system better? How can we organise our, um, you know, even our distribution of food and you know toilet paper and whatever in Woolworths and Coles at the moment is done purely for profit. If we had a distribution system that was set up for people, it would be better for ordinary people. So, you know, this crisis points the way towards... Uh, towards solutions that will help us in this crisis but also give us a better society in general. And the only way that's going to happen is if people organise and push for them because if uh, if we don't, the capitalist government is going to impose their own, uh, their own solutions which are going to be looking after corporations and more doggy dog survival and you know, a less good society for the majority. True words. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, thank you, Alex. <laughs> Hope you have a good morning. You yep. too.